you're listening to this video, but I don't know who you are because you can't interact with me. Uh, whereas I can interact with Mihai, who is my guest on this contributor spotlight. We're going to find out what motivates him, what his favourite celebrities are, and may maybe we'll uh, dig into other topics as well. I don't know. Hey everyone, my name is Mihai and I'm a software engineer based in Dublin in Ireland and I come originally from Romania. I'm currently working at a healthcare company called Optum on data streaming at scale and the data mesh and data movement product based on Bentos. Originally, I focused on C++ and C Sharp development, but I switched to go around 2016 and I haven't looked back since. Um, at what point did you get interested in open source? Yeah, that was a very interesting period back in 2016, I think. So I, I was at Nitro, which is a PDF software company. And I, I was very lucky to find Karl Matthias uh, being there in the infrastructure team. So he's a principal engineer. I think now he's a director or VP at Community. And back then he was charged to um, build the backend infrastructure for this new cloud product that Nitro wanted to have, like PDF processing as a service, PDF manipulation, whatever you want. Um, and he started off with building a Mesos cluster in Amazon. And I got into his team and we started hacking around this thing called Sidecar, which is a dynamic service discovery um, utility written in Go. And that was my, my first experience with Go. I had no idea how to use Go. Um, he was championing it inside Nitro and I was very happy to work with him. And uh, having him as the mentor for a couple of years gave me a huge boost in terms of like learning all the tooling, learning all the things about uh, infrastructure, learning Amazon, um, managed services and such. Um, and with that background, I was able to like start learning a lot more about how to build various things in Go. And, and because this tool is open source, um, I started contributing to it and having my first open source contributions. So that's kind of where I always start. Was it like a community around it at that point, or was it just kind of like a, an open source, but mostly internal thing? Yeah, it was mostly like, uh, you, you know, like inside Nitro, we didn't really have any external customers for this. Um, and then I, yeah, it took me a while to kind of find the proper community to inject myself in. And honestly, I think Bentos was the first one where I really started engaging with maintainers and to tell them, hey, you know, I mean, you, <laughs> here I am and I can help you. <laughs> who's, who's this goofball running this project? This guy needs help. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can recall times when I was chatting with people from the MPIR community, which is like a big number, a big integral arithmetic library. It's a fork of GMP. And I was trying to use it for a project, but I was having a hard time with that. And I was trying to communicate to them and to see how, how it works. I didn't really find it very welcoming. Like it was a bit of a closed thing. Hmm. So I feel like those are, those are two classic examples of people's entry level experiences in open sources. You've got something that you, you are working on that's out there, you're kind of developing it in the open, but it's not, it's not as if it's like a, a massive community at that point. It's kind of like at the early stages of um, just a few people assembling around it. And then the other extreme is a, a project that po probably has a, a fairly large community, but it's, it's a bit more chaotic. It's a bit more difficult to sort of penetrate. Yeah, it's kind of uh, strange, especially before GitHub, people were using lots of funny version control systems mm -hmm. and it was very difficult to get any contributions then. Um, so before Nitro, I can't say I did that. I, I do recall sending somebody a patch via email, which was kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> and then it ended up in his code base, but it was like a very small project. And then I remember in Nitro, we were trying to use NATs for a few things. Um, and we started raising some issues with those guys and chatting on their Slack, but uh, we didn't really get to contribute anything back. Right. Uh, I couldn't identify any bugs in there. Like it was really solid. And <laughs> yeah, damn them. I didn't really see anything obvious. Uh, and then we saw Bentos and we were like, well, we have to use this somewhere. And just, I don't know, couldn't find any proper niche in there. It was kind of, um, we were using other things for, for this processing of uh, various data streams. We were using Kinesis. And then after Kinesis, we had uh, some Scala in there, and I, uh, I found it hard to displace that Scala with Go. Right. But you'd like put it, 
decided this was something that you kind of you were looking for an excuse to use. Yeah, yeah. And then I changed jobs and I got into this company called Cogito, but uh, I, I faced similar challenges there where there, there was already some sort of uh, streaming, uh, <clears throat> streaming system set up. And uh, yeah, the, there was not much to replace, honestly. Uh, I, I was supposed to like look for a new niche where I could plug in various things, uh, but Bentos was a bit further down the line and then I ended up changing jobs again. <laughs> and finally, in Optum, which is a big company, um, I saw a lot of the systems that do data streaming. And I'm like, okay, th this all need to be placed with Bentos right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we started out with uh, a bunch of projects that were supposed to um, talk to Azure and get some data from legacy on-prem solutions uh, into Azure. And somebody was already working on it. And they wrote this very janky container, uh, which had the Azure SDK in it. And it was doing exactly what Bentos was doing, but in a non-abstract way. And it was all like kind of hard-coded and um, hard to use. Um, and it took me about a month to kind of rip that out and plug Bentos in there. And then we had the very first uh, kind of MVP where um, people were using Bentos behind the scenes. They didn't even care much about what was doing the movement. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, copying gigabytes of data around in a kind of efficient way. And, and uh, yeah, that, that was enough to kind of prove that the system is, is good enough to... Um, try in other places as well. So, so basically this gives people a, um, kind of a feel of the product and they start trusting it. In big corporations, you're going to see a lot of this, uh, do you know who else is using it? Yeah. Um, is it trustworthy? Is it already proven in production? People see issues with it. And if you have no data to show, you're going to get a lot of pushback because it's a new system and everybody's freaking out. Pretty much. I mean, I, I, like that's that's a very common first question I get when people see it, and they're like, "Oh, this is cool. We could use this." And then they come back to me like, "Who else? How many companies are using this? How how popular is this?" I'm like, "I yeah. I don't know. I genuinely have no idea who's using this. I can see how much it's downloaded, but I can't. I I can tell you who contributes, um, but that's a drop in the ocean of the people that are using it. Um, right." But yeah, so th at that point, so you kind of like adopted it, and that was that was kind of a growing thing because obviously you you had it deployed, so now it's just a question of wait, and there's no issues with it, so um, you know the trust builds over time. But at, at what point was it kind of accepted that you contribute back? So um, that was a bit behind the scenes. Like I was starting on my own, and I knew that. Um, there's absolutely nothing preventing me from contributing from home. Right. So I started out by looking at uh, the code base and I saw that there's a bunch of things that could be improved or like, you know, made slightly better. Like, for example, I saw that there were many people sending pull requests without updating the documentation. And it basically required like running make docs before, send, before like, mm -hmm. submitting the PR. I thought that was a nice improvement. So I went in there and hacked a few, a few of the build scripts to do that. Um, and then at the same time, we had the need to have um, Azure um, storage support. For, I think I think we needed the input and you already had the output in there. So I went and wrote that and sent it upstream and it was really quickly merged. And that, that encouraged the company to see that it's easy to contribute to this project. And there wasn't a lot of red tape doing that. It was basically like, you know, send it and ask for forgiveness later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's kind of like an interesting one because like from, from my perspective, right, I, I've i always tried my hardest to merge things as quickly. Like if it's something that is going in and there's no question about that, it's like a new connector, for example. If it's going to happen, there's no reason not to merge this. I try and get it done as quickly as I can. And that's always been... Just, just a habit of, I, I would kind of freak out thinking, oh my god, they're, they're going to lose interest. You know, this is people that might might adopt this thing and they're going to they're going to disappear if if this doesn't happen. And it's felt like a bit of a paranoia that's kind of unjustified. But I've actually found that probably a lot of the traction of Benthos is because of that that sort of obsession and paranoia because like, you don't really get much feedback with open source. Um, right. so it's like you kind of have to be a little bit paranoid about things like that. it's the same with bug reports right if somebody raises a bug and you just leave it there to fester 
you have to be a massive open source project to get away with that habitually because otherwise people are going to see oh they're unresponsive let's move on elsewhere we can't trust this and then it's it's over um before it's even begun so it's like it's it's kind of um it's satisfying from my perspective to know that those those kind of habits actually do have an impact and it does it does matter even just something as trivial as making sure a, a pull request gets looked at you know within within a couple of days or something but I think it's more than that. It's about people who um, have never contributed to open source and they're not enabled or experienced enough to, to, to have that drive to look at existing contributions, to understand how they're done and why they got accepted. Mm. Um, and I can give examples. Like there are people who um, wanted to contribute to GoAvro, which is the Avro serialization library. And um, they were looking at it and found a few bugs and fixed the code that had the bug without adding any tests, without like really going through the explanations of why they, they made the changes. And then they submitted the PRs. And the PRs just ended up hanging there for yeah. like, you know, a few years. <laughs> and then, you know, they were wondering why don't they get merged? Well, first of all, you have to add tests. <laughs> if you don't, and if you don't follow the guidelines, if you don't try to um, kind of figure out what is the minimum required effort to get something in a large-ish code base, um, then people are, like the maintainers are totally justified to ignore you. Oh, yeah, and definitely. You yeah. can improve in time. But <laughs> it's not going to really fix the problem. You can, like end up sending as many PRs as you want. They're just going to end up sitting there because people are going to ignore them. Yeah, well, I mean, also, like, features that don't quite fit because, you know, they haven't consulted the maintainers or whatever. But, yeah, I mean, th there's there's been times where I've kind of... Um, I've overreached and have what basically taken somebody's pull request and in a kind of misguided rush to get it merged, I've then took it upon myself to kind of add all that stuff in. And I, I feel like that was that was something I was kind of happy to do, especially in the early days, because I, I needed contributors. I needed I needed some feedback that this was worth doing, that people were kind of invested in the project. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's at a point now where I kind of I kind of accept that you can't you can't do that for every pull request that's going to come through. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's a bit of a, you know, you've got to meet, meet halfway. You can't just because something's open source. It, it usually means the quality has to be higher um then you know people often come in with with the opposite mindset of like oh but because it's open source and it's free it doesn't have to be as uh high code coverage or you know the code doesn't have to be as clean or you know that kind of stuff and it's 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 totally the opposite but then that doesn't mean that you know you can't come in with like a draft and get guidance on some of that stuff because i mean right. if if somebody doesn't know how to make well tested maintainable code then I kind of feel like it's definitely a, a a a service of open source to try and kind of bring people up to that level because you know beggars can't be choosers, isn't it? So the back back to you because this is about this is about your story, okay? So you've contributed to stuff, but this is in this is like your spare time, right? This is like um, evenings and weekends kind of effort to bootstrap things, and uh, it's it's all about things that. Uh, make me happy so things that make me happy are a well-written code base and i i do like to see um things being improved over time and that that kind of drives me to at, at the very least um, make sure there's also flinters running on the code um, to 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 ensure patterns or to ensure that that is the basics are kind of following certain rules and that people don't deviate from them um, but beyond that it's, it's very important to see um, features having tests. And I, I do like to um, try my best to add as many tests as possible if I have the time. <laughs> and then it's all about uh, seeing a project grow. So this is something that, uh, at least for Bentos, I, I feel that uh, I can help the project grow further. And uh, I don't know, like just the idea that I contribute to something that uh, is written in a way um, that I can deal with and I don't feel like I'm compelled to like rewrite the whole thing from scratch or anything like that. Um, it just makes it a bit easier to 
um, get my change in there. And uh, it's kind of an isolated thing where um, I plug in the code I want to plug in and I don't have to like go through the whole code base and also refactor a hundred other things. So you t- um, you've already touched on two of my favorite interactions that we've had. Um, so the, the my, my memory, I might be wrong I might be misremembering some of this stuff, but my, my memory of like your kind of trajectory in the trajectory in the project was um I think the first thing was feature, like you said. And I think my, my immediate response is like, oh new contributor, and this looks very clean and tidy and neat. Oh, that's cool. And I think you had to you had to do some really nasty workarounds to get the um to get it tested, right? And I remember reading that yeah. and thinking, wow, that's unique. Somebody's put a lot of thought into <laughs> testing and verifying that the thing works. <laughs> that's refreshing. And then um the second one was the so the the, the second thing that you did was the linting changes so the the massive change to use um the golang ci uh linter and that was that was major for me because i think i think you probably but by the the interactions that we had in the pull requests you sounded kind of sheepish about oh i hope he's not going to be upset that i've i've come and brought this in because it was like a it was like linting rules that was genuine (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it's a genuine emotion i swear like i, I don't want to waste people's time and, well yeah uh, exactly that's what i'm saying like I, I i wish like i felt it i felt like oh this guy feels really bad but i was really excited about it because um it's because a it wasn't really that much work for me because you'd already done all the changes that <laughs> needed to be done for the most part uh, all i had to do was click merge and then the, the, you know the the thing is like stuff like that like adding in the linting rules and also the CI protections around the docs and stuff like that. Those are things that I've kind of, I've found, I've, I've put as much effort in as I can at the time, but like obviously at the, an open source code base where you're getting strangers coming in and contributing, you have to be so defensive and have all the test coverage and have the CI running and all those things. So to have somebody else come along and also be invested in that same thing was it was a huge relief um the other thing was so i I don't know how much of this you kind of realized i was i was hyper aware of was the um tweeting and posting benthos around like I, i feel like that was um i don't think people realize how shy i actually am about sharing stuff around because obviously i have a lot of goofy material um out in the open uh that i do share but to me it feels painful you know having to constantly remind people that this thing exists but obviously it doesn't grow unless you get eyes on the project so um it's kind of a struggle for me and then seeing that you know this this person's come along and you know he's he's contributing all the major areas of the code base and then also seeing that you know you're posting it around on um twitter and i don't know where else you were putting it uh oh everywhere <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, exactly so like just just like sharing it around um you know i've had a few people do that in the past and it's it's obviously like a, it's a relief it's a feeling of relief of like somebody else's you know is is putting it is it has has some interest has some investment in kind of um spreading spreading the word out uh, about this thing and so i think uh, that's kind of like honest uh spreading of the news because uh you can have people who are paid to do it right somebody who's not mm-hmm. even technical and they go to all the technical places and they send this tool along and they're like well here's something you should try and that mostly gets ignored. But when you have somebody who's uh, going there and genuinely has a good reason to explain why this is good, I think that has a lot more value. And um, yeah, I, I didn't see this being spread around that much. Like um, there's you tweeting and maybe there's like one, two more people kind of linking it here and there, but uh, it wasn't all that visible, I think. And for me, that's kind of an opportunity to also get myself out there and interact with people. So your future in open source, are you going to keep this up or how long are you going to keep keep going? Well, I think uh, as long as you'll have me. 
<laughs> if um, if Benthos disappeared though overnight, like if it was just dead, just gone from the internet, nobody had a, a cloned version locally, would you would you continue that momentum on another project? I think uh, I'd have a hard time finding a project that is very similar. There's a Swiss spot there. Um, there's very large projects. Look at the Kubernetes code base. It has hundreds of contributors or even the mm. Go language or whatever you have it. Um, and there's very small projects which are pretty much or most of the time inactive. So you can submit a pull request and it might get attention six months later at best. Um, and I was looking for this, like what are good projects to contribute to that well, you also have the skills to do so. I mean, it's not easy for me to pick up, let's say, um, I don't know, a Rust code base without yeah. having much Rust experience. And then it also doesn't have like hundreds of contributors such that I, I feel like I'm a small cog in a big machine. And um, yeah, so it, it has to be this kind of uh, small homegrown kind of thing. Where, uh, the scope is limited and uh, making a contribution is not like a months long endeavor. Um, and also like the complexity of the code. If you look at the compiler, for example, like some sort of, um, I don't know, very complex thing that has a lot of edge cases and you need to add the, or, you know, you need to modify hundreds of unit tests if you make a change, then that's not very exciting for me at least. It's, um, it's probably way too complex to do it while also working at the same time. So we have to be either part of the job or I can't do it in my spare time. This is where I think something like Bentos, which has all these adapters, uh, kind of lets you focus on one small piece yeah. and uh, a plug in. And I was I was looking at other projects as well. There's Keda, for example. And I think I could contribute to Keda if I have more time. Um, it's an autoscaler for Bentos. Uh, sorry, for Kubernetes. And there's Tanka, which is like a tool for um, deploying stuff to various Kubernetes clusters. I made a small contribution to it. Uh, I think it's a nice project, but a bit too enterprisey for me, I think. So if a project wants a Mihai to say I'm 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 an open source project maintainer and I'm in the market <clears throat> for my own Mihai, what's the best way of doing that? We mentioned being responsive on pull requests already. Um code base that matches your particular uh qualities. Um is it things like code coverage and linting tools and things like that? Uh, what else is there? I think, uh, you know, having a certain decent quality and it doesn't have to, like, quality is very objective, but uh, it does matter that you uh, follow the pattern and you have a very well-established pattern for developing things. Um, and I'm not talking about the old gang of four patterns. It's more like, okay, you build something around a certain library or you plug in various components, make sure you're consistent and, you know, things are kind of done in the same way for similar things. Um, and then speed, like for me, uh, coming from C++ where, you know, you hit the build button and then you wait a few hours for maybe a one character change to kind of <laughs> build and then you're able to run your tests. That's just depressing, like I'm not, too interested to do that anymore. Like I don't have the patience for it. If I can build something in like, you know, a few seconds and then run my test in another few seconds, that's great. Uh, if I have to wait around for it, I'm going to get very put off very fast. Then there's the whole uh, development setup. Like, is it very ceremonial? In order to like change a few things in the code, do I have to spin up 10 containers and install 100 packages locally? Yeah, let's not do that. Um, Ideally, it should be some sort of, uh, you know, if if the build tooling is too complex and it requires too many things, then maybe maybe a dev container would help, although yep. that does slow things down. But I think the dev container is, a, is the way to go for complex builds. Um, and then having a, a good way of running the integration test, because the, the thing that puts me off the most is to, like, create a pull request and then get all this like thing screaming at me, oh, you're all wrong. And everything is just a mess. Like, no, <laughs> let me test that locally first. Yeah. Um, so the dev instructions have to be pretty clear about what I have to do to uh, make a successful contribution. Um, how important is a Discord with kick-ass emojis? <laughs> I think that's one of the nicest features. I'm not, I'm, not sure, I'm not aware of any other community that has like such nice uh, setup for their... Uh, community engagement. Um, 
And it feels a bit like, uh, okay, there's two places where you can chat. There's also the Slack. Uh, but I, f- I, f- I find the Discord way more interesting and engaging. Um, also, it depends who lands in there, right? If you have uh, people who are like-minded and they're fun and they kind of dig into the humor and start to adopt it, then, of course, it becomes a lot more fun than uh, anything else. Um, it could use more memes, though. No. No, I think we're good for memes. No. Uh, right, uh if you're uh, if you want to check out uh Mihai, maybe steal him away from me um there's uh various links in the description of this video uh where you can go and cyber stalk him and um follow his tweets and uh there'll also be links to other communities where you might find him such as the benthos community uh anything you want to plug anything you want to uh, announce if anyone from the bioinformatics community is interested in trying out some sort of streaming processor for their work, um, some sort of system to um, transform large volumes of data really fast, uh, you should talk to me. I'm very interested in helping people who are doing bioinformatics, and I'm uh, very com- committed to um, engaging with that community. I think bioinformatics <laughs> people are nerds. Stay away from my project. <laughs> and stay away from my Mihai. No, they're fun nerds. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure. And um, thank you yeah, for nice. joining me on this journey. And thank you, everybody, for uh, for listening.